glad to be here with all of you today. Thanks for having us. Hi, everyone. So um, we thought we'd just start with a little bit of an introduction about ourselves and how we got to work together. I'm Ayn, obviously, and uh, I'm a writer, director, playwright type person. I'm particularly drawn to sort of marginalized or overlooked histories and the ways in which those histories, because they have leave gaps in, from, in information, don't get used by traditional form history, don't get disseminated because they're too incomplete. Uh, and I feel that theater can kind of enter that gap and be allowed to imagine in the gaps of fact. Uh, I would also like to just point out that I feel, I think we both agree on this, because we talk about it a lot, uh, that history itself is not a fact. History, history is an interpretive engine for delivering old fact to new people. It selects and interprets, which means it cannot be the story of everything that happened, which means that what you are receiving is in some way a story of what happened, which takes you into the realm of fiction. So a lot of what we're gonna to do today is tell you some of the stories that we know, and we hope we can hear from you and question some of the stories that you know, and we can have a, a real dialogue and conversation together. I'm H.B. Lazito. Uh, I'm the executive director of Out in the Open. I believe your program says Green Mountain Crossroads. We changed the name of our organization about a week ago, so we're in the midst <laughs> of all of this. Changed it with the Secretary of State, not yet on our bank accounts. Anyway, more detail than you need to know. Um, and uh, our organization is based in Brattleboro, Vermont, and we connect rural LGBTQ people to build community visibility, knowledge, and power. So we work throughout northern New England um, in a variety of ways, some more traditional social service, peer support groups, um, giving money and housing to folks who need those kinds of things, and some longer form projects um, like our work with AIN about oral history, about uncovering lesser known and unknown histories, specifically in rural areas of LGBTQ people and movement histories. Um, and really, for us, using those kinds of projects as ways to connect people not only across generations, but across geography, um, across urban-rural uh, experiences, as well as looking at how are we bringing that knowledge and, and moving us all forward into the future together as part of our, our, part of our movement-building work. Um, so that's what we're doing up in Vermont. I keep forgetting, I have the clicker, here we go. Um, and so, Anne and I started our work together about four years ago in 2015, teaching at Marlboro College, looking at uh, social movement histories of radical movements in southern Vermont and in western Massachusetts, sort of that northern New England area. Um, and this video is from a project about the Andrews Inn. You, do you want to say more this about was it? A, this was what we would now, what they then called a gay bar. We might not use that term now, and we're going to keep sort of trying to annotate the terms and as we go forward. Um, this was a gay bar that existed from 1973 to 1984 in Bellows Falls, Vermont, which is a small um, ex-train stop <laughs> town. <laughs> Literally. Um, and it was virtually the only place to go at that time if you were gay or wanted to be in a gay bar, uh, if you wanted to go dancing, pretty much. People drove from New Hampshire, Connecticut, throughout Vermont, um, Montreal. Massachusetts, Montreal. People came from far away. You could take the train from New York and arrive at two in the morning yeah. or something. Uh, and then dance all night and then stay in the hotel that was above it. Um, this, so it thrived and it was like many of these places a kind of open secret in the town. Everyone knew that it had been there. Everyone had a relationship to it, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, it was legendary and yet it was historically invisible. So we worked to kind of create this oral history project. We had a reunion uh, in the restaurant that is at where the bar once was. We had a reunion dance party with elders who reappeared, some of them seeing each other for the first time in 30 years on the dance floor. Um, and HB did an extensive oral history project. Yeah, so we interviewed um, about 15 people over four years. We continue connecting with new people and, and interviewing folks and featured in the project. Um, at this present time is six people that we talked to. The video clip that you're gonna hear today, um, this person is Jeremy Yost. He was one of the owners of Andrews Inn. He purchased it with his partner, Tom Herman, in 1979 from the original owners, um, John Moises and his family. 
who his mom and dad also, they all sort of all started the Andrews Inn together. Um, and Jeremy's going to tell you a little bit more about how he and Tom came to Andrews Inn. Um, we wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of that history and of this kind of work. Mike. You. Yeah, it was um, Thanksgiving weekend, 1978. When Tom and I went up to this gay club, this kind of seedy gay club, mm. but we, you know, we're like, let's go check it out. John Moises and the building and everything was owned by his dad, Andy. And um, John was like the perfect innkeeper host kind of person. And he said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, it's for sale. Do you want to buy it? And <laughs> Tom and I looked at each other like, uh, why not? Let's do it. So Tom is the big, you know, he's the Leo on the Cancer. He's the sun on the moon. You know, he was the big cheese. So it was, I was the perfect queen. And as long as I kind of played that role, which I did, I thought fairly well, we had an unstoppable team. First, we started with this group foster home, and then we bought the inn on a yeah. wing and a prayer. We started with a thousand dollars and we raised three hundred and fifty thousand. It was, you know, that's Tom. Mm. He could sell a three legged horse with two broken legs. And you know, he was my man. I mean he was it. He was you know he I met him when I was eighteen. You know, so, and I was really mm. messed up at the time. And he literally pulled me back from the edge of the cliff and said, you know, don't give up yet. There's, there's more to life than this. And, and it was a life changer, literally a life changer. So we were, you know, the, in addition to just our lifestyle, the, you know, the rural gay couple, we were also very interested in, you know, in healing yeah. is the bottom line. The main miss mission was to get publicity, was to get out there, to get normalized, to say, you know, we're just two nice boys. Oh, yeah, they're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, the two nice boys run that. You know, the, we were the two nice boys. We wanted two things at once. We wanted people to heal from their wounding and heal from their addiction. I think if I were to do this again, obviously, I would do it more from a therapeutic standpoint, yeah. you know. Um, but then, you know, we were 20s. Right. It was yeah. about having fun and, yeah. and holding hands and mm -hmm. just one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a number of people who that was enough. Just coming in and those big doors closing, coming into the lobby, mm -hmm. you know, in that brick building. It's mm -hmm. like, Wow. I haven't felt this safe in a while. He was like, okay, this is what it feels like to be standing with my husband, leaning up against the, the front desk, arm in arm, arm around each other, mm -hmm. looking out going, well, how about this, huh? Yeah, we, we could do this. We could make a difference. So as Anne knows, we could do a million-hour presentation about Andrew's Inn, but um, a little but, bit but of a taste wait, for wait, you. Before we jump forward, just to yeah. say, like, one of the things that this is, is in all full that, uh, that recording and through all the work we do and through the whole talk we're going to do is questions of what does historical significance look like for communities that needed to move undercover in order to thrive? What does it look like? It, you know, history is all about drama and scale. What does drama and scale look like for communities that are moving invisibly? So um, now you have a taste of who we are and how we met and what we do together. And to kind of segue to the next section where we're going to cram an unbelievable amount of history at you, um, we're going to just use as a segue a, a little clip from a play I wrote called 217 Boxes of Dr. Henry Anonymous. Uh, this play was inspired by the true story uh, of a man named Dr. Fryer, who was a psychiatrist, 
who uh, agreed in 1972 to testify before the American Psychiatric Association to tell them that, that psychiatry was not a mental disease, which is how it was classified at the time. He was a psychiatrist, so he would have lost his license overnight if he appeared in public and said that he was a gay psychiatrist. So he agreed to appear if he could call himself Dr. Henry Anonymous, wear a rubber joke shop mask and an oversized tuxedo and speak into a distorting microphone. And he made a speech that began, I am a homosexual, I am a psychiatrist. This was in 1972, and the next year, homosexuality was removed from the diagnostics manual as a disease. Um, so I spent two years with his archive and wrote a play, and the play uh, talks, imagines Fryer's life through the lens of three people who knew them. So this is an excerpt from the first, the end of the first <laughs> character's monologue. This is based on another real person whose name was Alfred A. Gross who ran a small organization in New York that helped men in trouble with the law, which meant essentially men who'd been arrested in raids or in stings in public bathrooms and in bars, uh, trying to help them get a lenient sentence. He is, in that way, a crucial figure in the creation of what we now call the movement, although he is entirely invisible and overlooked which he has problems with. <laughs> we'll do the clip now. He couldn't publicly be a deviant and a psychiatrist. Yes, yes, I know some, some young ones here may say we stopped too short. It was men helping men. White men helping white men. Privileged white men helping, yes. But I will get back up on my high switch horse to ask that you understand how little we understood or could. No doctor could be seen as one of us, our problem. No, no therapy to support us, our problem. No visible gathering of any of us, our problem. No role models to look to. No history to grow from. We were building the structure upon which you now are. Our vision is what allows you now to see where we were short-sighted. Oh. What an irritable little blowfish puffing up. <laughs> I'll go. I hope you now see all the <coughs> tiny steps, or well, some of the tiny steps, toward John becoming the man who might don the mask to destroy the mask enforced for, on, by all our kind. I was the Cro-Magnon of homosexual freedom. So John might stand upright, so you could march. Fourteen years later, I died in the basement of a pitying colleague. I was 91, an invisible. So I brought you these. You see this number here, three, four, six, five. Yep. Forget your glasses, ears. Just trust me. Three, four, six, five. That is the file number for all of John Fryer's papers at the archive where I wait. Yes? You see the address is right here. Three, four, six, five gets you everything. Box 41, that's my box written for you right here by me, that gets you Alfred A. Gross. So as I have said in life, as frequently as I could, you now have my number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
um, building on Gross's statement of being the Cro-Magnon of homosexual freedom, we would like to look back behind Stonewall, which is commonly held as this turnkey moment in, well, a turnkey moment is kind of acceptable. It is commonly held sometimes as the birth of the movement, which we absolutely don't agree with. So we would like to talk about the way in which perhaps it was a turnkey, but look at roughly 20 years leading up to that moment and talk about the ways in which everyone was already at work on the things that made that moment possible. Because the calling it the birth erases all those steps and erases all the people and ev events that it takes to create a turnkey moment to make that possible. We're gonna shove a huge amount of stuff at you, super fast, because the clock, giant <laughs> clock right here, is ticking in our face. So we're gonna try and shove it at you faster than you can bear, sorry, but mostly to give you an idea of how much, how much was already going on. Yes, yeah, just really the very overwhelming amount of activity that was already happening. You know, we've called this talk Stonewall at 50, but we're, we're winding the clock back, I, you know, as an organizer, very interested in how things actually happen. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Um, so we're starting with the Mattachine Society. Are folks out there familiar with Mattachine? Yes, yes. Um, so Mattachine Society is founded in 1950 by our friend Harry Hay. I say our, like our in the general hour. I don't know him. Um, <laughs> Harry Hay uh, in Los Angeles in 1950, Harry would go on to found um, the Radical Fairies, who, you know, for those of us rural folks, um, spend a lot of time in the 70s and beyond up to the present day um, in those kinds of spaces, creating sanctuary for LGBTQ people. And so Harry and friends, uh, cisgender men, uh, mostly founded Mattachine Society as, as one of the first you know, we're going to say this a lot, one of the first, in quotes, that we know of, well-known, again, in quotes, um, gay rights organizations in the United States really trying to get at, um, again, we're, we're before the notions of advocacy are really happening, but wanting to put gay people out in front. Um, and just to note that the fellow holding, holding the poster, go back one sec, that holding gay is good, that is Frank Kameny, who is arguably one of the fathers of the gay rights movement, although he is later kind of disowned by the movement. We might get to that, but just so you know. And so by 1961, you know, they have, we see uh, in this photo, Mattachine Society of Washington, founded in Los Angeles, but you know, by the, by the 60s, they have chapters sort of all over and throughout the United States. Um, so a couple more pictures of them. I love, I love this picture so much. <laughs> <laughs> And again, we're you know we're we're picking and choosing the highly. Uh, this is a highly subjective history, so some elements just very in and very out. subjective. Okay, Christine Jorgensen was an American trans woman, a term that would not have been used at the time, who in 1952 became arguably the first to become widely known in the U.S. for having sex reassignment surgery. Okay, let's call out a bunch of things in there. Not the first the first to become widely known, not the first to be known, the first to be widely known in the US. There were others in other countries. We would also not necessarily call this sex reassignment surgery now. Some call it sex confirmation or affirmation surgery or gender affirmation surgery. I, I'm not having a problem with any of the words. What I have a problem with is forgetting how many words there were before the words or all the words we've decided to replace the words with. Because if we agree to not unpack the sentences, then we are part of how history gets to reduce the story to what it can tell. So, so we have that conversation among ourselves a lot of what are the words that we're using for people and comfort or discomfort with words that we may use today, um, you know, as Ayn is alluding to here, and can you use words for someone else that they didn't use for themselves even if they died decades ago? And anyway... Yeah. We can I, talk about I, I all of that. I have said many times, I refuse to rename the dead with a name they did not give them themselves. I will use the term they would have used, and then I will use the term that we might use, but I will use both side by side. Continuing on our march ever forward, um, <laughs> Daughters of Belitis, founded in 1955, uh, here by Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin, 
um, which as a young queer person growing up in the 90s, I remember seeing them on the front covers of many newspapers. They were some of the first um, women in the US to get legally married when civil unions were happening. And again, under historicized, I remember thinking like, who are these old people that I know nothing about and care nothing for at that time? Um, my personal opinion has obviously changed on that now. And I think um, their position within movement history was not widely shared at that time either. It seemed, again, a, a moment in history. Um, and so Phyllis and Dell, and of course many other people, founded Daughters of Belitis in 1955 in San Francisco. Um, the name Daughters of Belitis really came from a desire to sort of obscure their own workings. Belitis is rumored to have been a contemporary of Sappho, although who's ever heard of that? Um, I mean, Sappho certainly, but not Belitis. We have, you know, no idea. Um, and so they were wanting to really, again, stay under the radar to create spaces where lesbians could be together that were outside of bars, that were being raided constantly. Um, not necessarily a notion of safer spaces, but just that a place where people could be together um, that had less of a chance of being raided. Right, and as HB mentioned before, this is kind of before the movement has thought much about advocacy. It is... It begins at the tail end of this time, but it really, at this point, we're in a community building and social organizing stage in which people are just trying to get to know each other in some safe way that they're in control of. Which again, we see coming back over and over. I often, I often drag us into the present and Ayn drags us back to the 1800s. So, you know, we're doing a lot of that still in our work today, just creating spaces for people to be together in places. You'll also, we're, what we're also trying to do in this conversation is connect people to each other. So here we have Barbara Giddings, um, who was the founder of the chapter of Daughters of Belitis in Philadelphia. Um, and I often hear of her disconnected from the rest of Daughters of Belitis, disconnected from Phyllis and Dell. But, you know, what we're wanting to do is weave together all of these people who knew each other, who were active together. Right. And, I, and we know that she was the founder of the Philadelphia chapter for sure, because I recently uh, visited her former partner, Kay Lahusen, her widow, uh, in a senior home who told me that Dell asked Barbara to start the Philadelphia chapter and insisted that they should have a barbecue in New Jersey and invite women to run it, and that's how they met. Uh, Barbara also, with Frank Kameny, uh, is the person who made the panel on which Dr. Fryer in disguise testified. So Barbara and Frank get together. Barbara, for some reason, does not get disowned as much of that generation does by the gay movement going forward like Frank does. Uh, it's me now, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, the Cooper Donuts Riot. Um, this is May 1959 in Los Angeles. Let's just talk about the word riot for a minute. Um, this is Stonewall is also often called a riot. Um, many of these events we're going to talk about are. I have a problem with that word. Some people uh, refer to them as uh, rebellions. Some people call them uprisings. Um, the problem with riot is that the common definitions of riot have to do with misbehavior, disorganization, and or criminal conduct. So it is a way of, I think, labeling these events with a word that connotes to us something that is discardable. And whether or not they were organized, as many of the events we're going to tell you about were not, they were spontaneous, but they were spontaneous responses to systemic behavior on the part of police. So we're just going to keep calling out that word riot as we go forward. Um, this event, as I said, 1959 in Los Angeles, um, it was a, a donut place <laughs> where they <laughs> served coffee and donuts in which uh, transgender women, lesbian women, drag queens, and gay men rioted. Again, we would use none of those words to describe those people at the time. These are our words now. Uh, it is arguably one of the first uprisings or riots or rebellions in the United States, uh, and it was in response to consistent police harassment. Me again. Black Knight. Uh, this is in 1961 in Milwaukee. This is called a brawl. That is what, uh, if you Google it, you will find the word brawl attached anytime you can find it online. Again, a problematic word. Um, and this 
is an event that is interesting and is about a lot of these events that we're going to talk about again when we talk about the question of historic significance. This is an event, if I tell it to you, it sounds like almost nothing and it's hard to even understand what I'm telling you. Four straight servicemen went to a gay bar. The bouncer wanted them to show ID. They refused. He tried to throw them out. They left. They got mad. They came back. A fight broke out. The patrons of the bar ejected them. Everybody got arrested. The point is, once again, that the people in this bar felt entitled or enabled to eject four straight men in uniform, that they felt they had the right, that they felt that they were being trespassed upon, that, and they felt that they could act that out publicly. So you have to really kind of like massage these events to understand how the historical significance plays out, as opposed to like, well, it's a brawl. I mean, whatever, some guys want to go in. And this is going to happen again and again as we go forward in these events. Well, and this, I just learned about this week. Has anyone else heard of the Black Knight in Milwaukee? No. Yeah, no, me either. Late night um, texting. <laughs> <laughs> until this week, and, and I think, you know, I don't think of Milwaukee as sort of like a hotbed of queer activism in the 60s. Um, and I think, you know, for us, there's, there's this continuous uncovering, there is this continuous learning, and I think as you know, both we as LGBTQ people and other folks who care about our history um, continue talking and continue learning. Um, there are more of these kinds of things that are coming to light all the time. So this was good timing for this talk. I was like, this is perfect, great, let's put it in here. Um, so we're moving back to Philadelphia. A lot of the things that we're talking about are happening in Philadelphia. Um, and, and you'll also notice that some of the things we're highlighting here are, you know, pinpoints, are instances, Cooper's Donut, and some are foundings of organizations. So obviously all of these organizations that we're talking about did many, many things, and we're just highlighting their founding. I just want to mention that. Um, so Janus Society, founded in 1962 in Philadelphia, was one of the early what they called homophile movements. Um, Let just to call that word out. So many of these things were called homophile organizations leading up to Stonewall. Sometimes after, there's like a homophile action league that's founded right afterwards. This was because homophile was like anglophile. It meant you were interested in the culture of, but you yourself did not have to identify as. Therefore, if the police raided a meeting, you would just say, well, we're all interested in the culture. We're supporters. We're not ourselves. Again, you know, much like folks in Daughters of Belitis, looking for ways to cover. Um, if you're in the know, you're in the know. And if you're not, you have, you know, a ready excuse for not going to prison or jail um, or getting arrested. So Janus Society, 1962, they were the publishers of Drum magazine. Um, and they started receiving a lot of heightened pressure from police, a lot of heightened pressure from law enforcement due to their publishing of this magazine and also their involvement with other sex-related businesses. And so they actually closed um, in 1969, sort of shuttered their operations several months before Stonewall. You again. Me again. Um, yeah. This is Reed Erickson. Um, he is a trans man who was born in 1917. Um, I always am about to say here in the U.S., but I don't actually know where he was born. Um, born in 1917, he was a philanthropist and founded the Erickson Educational Foundation in 1964, um, one of the earliest, um, again, sort of organizations collected, um, working specifically for trans folks in the United States, um, gave millions and millions of dollars up until his death in 1992, and really, they were some of the first folks who were focused on peer support for trans people, focused on building educational resources um, for healthcare providers, for therapists, for counselors, um, all of these kinds of things. They published a newsletter as well. Here's the first issue, which came out in spring of 1968, one year before Stonewall. Is that what you were going to say? Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah, again, their goals were really mainly around education, but he affected a lot of um, specifically trans movements in the US um, from 1964 up until the 90s and beyond. Reminder Day. So Reminder Day uh, happened annually uh, from 1964 to 1969 in Philadelphia on July 4th. And it was created to remind people that not everyone had access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's worth noting that 
This is also an exact strategy that the abolitionist movement used in Philadelphia on July 4th outside Independence Hall, and women's suffragettes used on July 4th outside Independence Hall. So there's a long tradition in Philadelphia of oppressed groups taking this holiday as a means of protest. Um, this was organized by Frank Kameny, remember with the poster, Gay is Good, Mattachine Society, and Barbara Giddings, remember her and her partner who I met. They created this event, and it is arguably the first organized, repeated gay rights protest in the nation. So far as I can find, that is still true. Um, this photo I love because it's the last Reminder Day, which was 1969, just a few weeks after Stonewall, maybe not even weeks, a week after Stonewall. Um, and the Reminder Day was uh, very strictly organized by Kameny uh, in the kind of, in the model of the early civil rights movement. Women were instructed to wear stockings and dresses and men were instructed to wear shirts and ties. It was part of what is sometimes now retroactively called accommodationist politics. And it is one of the reasons that Frank Kameny is kind of disregarded by the post-Stonewall movement, although I think there wouldn't be Stonewall without Frank Kameny. This is, as I say, a week after it, and you see these two women holding hands, which was a direct contradiction to what the uh, rules of behavior as Frank Kameny had laid them out were, and it's because Stonewall had happened and things had changed. And in fact, the reason that there is gay pride, or a reason that there is gay pride, is uh, Kameny and Giddings said to themselves, things have changed, the energy is there, and they decided to cancel any more of these and move everything to New York and create gay pride. It was a decision, not an accident. We're still back in Philadelphia. We continue, <laughs> continue to go back to Philadelphia um, for Dewey's sit-in in 1965. Dewey's was a lunch counter where all kinds of people went, but where um, in 1965 LGBTQ people, which again, we would not have said at that time, um, were asking for public, ac public accommodations and being able to use the restrooms at the lunch counter. Um, Dewey's was not interested in having that happen necessarily and um, so they had a sit-in, much like, you know, inspired at the same time as the civil rights movement, um, seeing the effectiveness of sit-ins as a strategy. Folks were doing that here as well. Um, and the Janus Society, remember them, uh, is active in Philadelphia as well and ends up sort of connecting with this sit-in, although they did not start the sit-in and handing out many leaflets and continuing to try to build on the action that was happening there, calling for more and increasing protests throughout, um, throughout the summer months of that year. Okay, the sip-in. <laughs> um, I can't, how many of you ever heard of the sip-in? Nobody, right? Yeah. So, love that. How many, how many was that? <laughs> Two. Cool, that's unusual. Um, so now we are in 1966 in New York. Now, many cities, uh, and this is also hard to plumb uh, to actually get the facts on because you would have to be able to get to legal records, but many cities had on the books at this time laws which said that you could not serve alcohol to a known assembly of homosexuals. Uh, or that you could not, or that any known assembly of homosexuals was automatically disorderly conduct, or that um, you could not, if you raided a bar and people of the same gender, again, we're talking about assigned at birth gender, were dancing with each other, they could immediately be taken off to jail. So in bars where women and men danced together, if they raided, it was known, you would call out raid and everyone would switch partners. Um, and also there were laws about if there was a raid, how many items of the appropriate gender clothing you had to have on in order to not be arrested. This is for real. In New York, uh, I think it was five items, and in Philadelphia, I think it was three. And I interviewed a self-proclaimed trouser dyke in Philadelphia who told me that with her jeans and her boots and her plaid shirt, she would wear pearls and earrings. And then if they got raided, she would go one, two, three. So she would not get arrested. 
So um, these uh, fellows in Philadelphia, in New York, <laughs> decided that they would stage a protest and they would go to a bar and order, and before the drinks were poured, they would say, we're homosexuals, and see what would happen. <laughs> and they uh, called the New York Times and several other reporters to meet them at a bar on 8th Street. Um, they were late, I think because they were still dressing. And the reporter got there before them and told the, told the restaurant owner, who promptly closed the restaurant and put up a sign saying, if you're gay, stay away. They went, in fact, to three more restaurants. It's the most checkered story. Uh, one of them was Howard Johnson's, where they just said, well, we don't care, and served them anyway, so that didn't work. <laughs> uh, and so finally, they got themselves to Julius's, uh, which is in the West Village and is still there, uh, and is now supposedly getting landmark status. That's another story. And they went there. Now, Julius's was known as a kind of like a gay bar that wasn't a gay bar. Gay people went there all the time, but it wasn't a gay bar. And um, there was a sign in the bar that said that if you were ordering at the bar, you must face the bar so that you didn't, couldn't turn away and cruise. Um, so they, they were, there was a kind of constant presence. And it, like Stonewall, was owned by the mafia. Who, so there was payola happening. But uh, they had been raided the night before because some cop uh, uh, basically trapped a guy into flirting with him in the bathroom and then arrested him. So they showed up finally after three places didn't work out there. And you see them in uh, the three guys in the center, the raincoat, and the second one with uh, opposite the bartender and the third one. And they went, as you see, accommodationist politics in the jacket and the tie and the suit, the whole thing. And they went up, and they said, we'd like a drink. And the guy put down the glasses, and they said, we're homosexual. And he put his hand over the glass and said, you know, I can't serve you. And this picture was in the Village Voice. And so I, you know, for us, this is also a really good strategy, right, that we continue to use today. A lot of my work before I came to Out in the Open um, was organizing with a group called Camp Trans, uh, getting trans women into Michigan Women's Music Festival. And this was a strategy that we used as well of, you know, we know this is a place where our folks are not wanted. Let's go up to the gates and tell them who we are, you know, much like the folks at Julius is in, standing on the shoulders of greatness and say, you know, sending people there to say, I'm a trans woman and I would like to buy a ticket, and they say no. And, you know, I think providing those opportunities for confrontation and to really helps clarify um, where is it that everybody stands. And I think, you know, unknowingly at the time, we're continuing this legacy of doing that kind of thing that happened at Julius's. I just would also like to say, because it was such a beautiful thing, when we, we did an excerpt of that 217 box, the Dr. Fire play, uh, when it was being developed at the New York Public Library and there were two elderly men in the front row and at the end of them, the end, they came up to talk to me and one of them was one of these men. There are many moments like that. Yeah. <laughs> is this me? No, it's you. No, this is me. I'm just looking at this, po at this photo. Um, so here we are in San Francisco in the Tenderloin, Compton's Cafeteria. Is anyone familiar with Compton's Cafeteria? Um, this is of, of yeah, yes. our history oh, buff, yes. yes. <laughs> um, I, I feel like of the lesser known things that happened before Stonewall, Compton's is more of the well-known of the lesser knowns, if you can follow <laughs> me. Um, and so this was in 1966. Compton's Cafeteria was a place um, where drag queens and trans women and all kinds of people would go. Um, and not, well, they were friendly, but they were not necessarily welcomed by the owners of Compton's Cafeteria. And so they would call the police on them all the time. They would try to get them kicked out. They would harass them. Um, all of these kinds of things that we know happened all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the story goes essentially one night someone got fed up, the cops came in, she threw a cup of coffee at them, and the, and the whole place exploded. Um, trans historian Susan Stryker, who is amazing, if you want to learn more about any kind of history, I highly recommend um, looking up her work, has done... And, and very readable. You don't need <laughs> to know before. I've g given this book to many people who say, I don't know anything about this. Say, here, this book will, will get you in. Definitely. Um, she made a really great documentary called Screaming Queens um, about Compton's Cafeteria Riots. That interview, she interviews a lot of the people who were there 
um, and they tell their story in their own words. This is the present day location of Compton's Cafeteria. Um, I, this is making me think of the, the present day Andrew's Inn um, location is still available. And I, I think it's also amazing that the present day location of Stonewall is still in existence and so many of these physical locations are lost and it's incredible actually when they still are there and the feeling of being able to actually go to these places where, they th where these things happened um, is very special. Uh, yeah. The Black Cat Tavern protest, riot, brawl, uprising, again, you know, we've already talked about that, right? Uh, this was, though, in fact, a civil demonstration, though that is not always the term you find next to it. Again, there were, you now know about the kind of laws that were on the books that would allow police to raid, and this was, they were continually harassing the police, the frequenters of this bar, and one of the practices that was common and was also done at Stonewall on the night of the first raid uh, was to, uh, the police would bring a paddy wagon, but they would also call the press, the local press in the town or the city, and arrange for photographers to be there as they loaded the men one by one into the paddy wagon, usually men, uh, and have their photograph then be appearing in the paper the next morning, which before Dr. Fryer gets homosexuality not to be a mental disease, meant essentially you were labeled a sexual deviant in the press. So your career and personal life would largely be over if you were in any way working in the mainstream. So these, uh, the people in this bar decided to protest. 200 people did an organized protest. It is one of the first organized protests, not a repeated one, so not like Reminder Day but one of the first organized protests. It was organized by a group called Pride, I think a very early appearance of that word. Pride, which stood for personal rights in defense and education. And the other organizer was a group called SCCRH, not catchy, uh, the Southern California Council on Religion and Homophilism. Remember that word, so now you know. Uh, the protest was met by squadrons of armed policemen, and two of the men who kissed were arrested and charged and officially registered as sex offenders. Which, you know, it continued to happen, obviously, through many decades after this. Um, folks were having those kinds of experiences. I love this photo because I feel like I could be at a rally today and these signs, you know, search and seizure, at all of these. Um, Echoes of history in the present, um, which is an apt thing to say going into this slide. Um, so a lot of the things that we've talked about have been occurrences that are happening in urban spaces and in cities. Um, and uh, you know, our work is about rural areas. And so Anne and I are also very interested in finding out you know, what's happening in those spaces. Um, and so early on in our research, uh, Marshall Bloom was one of these people who we found out about. Does anyone know, have heard of Marshall before? No. Not you over there, no. <laughs> um, so Marshall, along with his friend Ray Mungo, who's in the bottom corner here, were the founders of Liberation News Service, which in the 60s and 70s, well, 60s, um, was essentially like the Associated Press for Radical Newspapers. Um, the one. It is the one. Yeah. I mean, I can't stress enough. It, all of the radical press in the 60s were getting their wire service from this guy. Mm-hmm. And at the time, he was living in cities. And in 1968, they all decided to move to rural Western Massachusetts um, for a number of reasons. Um, some uh, in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination, really needing to get out of the city, feeling like that was a very unsafe place for them to be. Some wanting to just feel what it was like to be your own person, separate from millions of other people. There is also evidence that the Liberation News Service had been infiltrated by the FBI, and the FBI had threatened to out Marshall, who was in the closet, uh, and to out him to his compatriots, and so he was also running away from that because he was not out and his compatriots did not know aloud. Although the FBI continued to follow him, we have his FBI file, and they were, you know, there with him in the tiny town of Montague, Massachusetts, after they moved on. Um, and so Marshall, you know, almost invents. Go. Well, he almost invents the um, commune movement. Mm -hmm. 
the, nearly the first two communes that there are, Total Loss Farm and Montague Farm, are founded by him and his compatriots. Uh, and on, on Total Loss Farm, well, I'm jumping to the end of Marshall, but uh, Marshall, uh, we don't know, no one knows. We th there are strong feelings that he was threatened again, a second round of threats from the FBI, and Marshall committed suicide uh, in 1969, shortly after Stonewall, which we don't know if he would have known about. We don't know if the news would have gotten to him that fast. Uh, and he committed suicide, and in the wake of that, <laughs> nearly all of the men at Total Loss Farm come out of the closet. And this kind of gay flourishing happens in the commune movement, partially because people are saying, okay, there's no time to lose, we need to come out. And so much of it was unspoken at that time before he committed suicide, and you know, as Zane is saying, a lot of folks, it went unsaid between them, even though we know folks in this picture were living together as lovers on the farm um, in gay relationships, but you know, folks have said often, like, you just didn't talk about it at that time. <sighs> That's Ray Mongo typing. <laughs> and so we're bringing this into, you know, these, these types of activities in organized ways in communities of people were also happening in rural spaces in pre-Stonewall time um, in those kinds of places as well. Butterworth Farm, you know, this is, okay, we say this is 1973, the founding of this farm, founded specifically as a gay commune um, in very close to where Marshall Bloom's farm was. Um, but, you know, it's like news travels slower in rural places. Um, I always feel like the community I grew up in is like 20 years behind everywhere else. Um, things just come to us more slowly. And so, I, you know, here we are in 1973, but we don't know how long that news took to travel. It feels all in sort of the same kind of zone. And so this farm um, founded by five gay men, one of whom is Alan Young, um, really as a gay specific place to get away from everything else and just live in community together. We put this in just because we want to say that in the way, same way we're talking about the way that history is this ruthless editing machine that gets rid of what doesn't help it deliver the story it's chosen, it also privileges urbanity. And it does not, we don't see the sort of concurrent strands of both uh, people moving out of urbanity into rural life but taking their politics with them or it, the reciprocal nature of that. So we wanted to just say that, you know, this is, totally still happening, this is happening concurrently. It is not only an urban issue. Which is a large part of our work today as well, right? We, we know that LGBTQ people have been in every community for as long as there have been people. Um, but again, it's often thought of as living in urban spaces. So even then, pre-Stonewall, here we are. Okay, we have arrived. Okay, so here we are, <laughs> Stonewall. Uh, now you have way too much information that you can barely remember. <laughs> Uh, and we could tell you 10 times more. Uh, but the question is, then we get to Stonewall, which has been delivered to us as the birthplace, as the turning point, as the spark. I'm willing to accept at least some of those words. Uh, but why do, we, why do we remember it? Why have we received it? Why is it useful for history and the movement whatever that is, the LGBTQIAA movement, why is it useful to take this moment and call it the birthplace? And in doing so, who do we think was there? Who do, what do we think we know about it? And does any of that really help us? Does it matter? Does it help us remember appropriately what it was, what it did, how we got there, and what we did from there? And or does it help us do our work better now in the present day? This fixation on the first brick, um, does that actually get us anywhere? I don't know. Um, so some we, of, you it's go. a little bit about who, now we're gonna talk a little bit about who was actually there, who, or we think was actually there. Again, there are, the facts are hard to do here, they're slippery. But until very recently, some of the people we're about to talk about were not included in this story. They were just not there. They were um, they're mentioned on the Wikipedia page, but in any kind of public display of the story, like the Stonewall movie of two years ago, three years ago, they are invisible, they are written out. And only now are they beginning to be re-included. So here we have Marsha Payette No Mind Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, really mothers of our movement, um, both of whom were at Stonewall, both of whom at various times have said, yes, it was me who threw the first whatever, no, it definitely wasn't me. Um, 
they both I was there, I was not there, stop asking me, all those things. All of those things and more. Uh, they both lived in New York. They were the founders of an organization called Star Street Transvestite Re Action Revolutionaries. Um, in, in 1970, what year is it? Two? Or yeah. I think it's 1970. Just put that in your head, right? They These two, uh, what would then have been called drag queens, who are virtually living on the street, both of them at various times in sex work in order to make a living, get a building in New York and create an organization called STAR in 1971. They themselves are one inch from living on the street. And both of them, again, at various times, would be living back on the street. Um, they both were, Marsha tells the story later that she showed up after she had already heard some things had started happening at the Stonewall. Um, but both of them were, you know, frequenters of Stonewall often um, beyond that night as well. And you all know Stonewall was three nights, not just... A, right, we should lay some facts. Stonewall was three nights, so people come and go out of the story and which night you were there, and it is 50 years ago, so asking people which night you were there is maybe not fair. Um, and it spilled out into the streets and became a full-fledged riot, uprising, rebellion, brawl. So people also joined who had never been to the bar or weren't in the bar, but who came around the corner and heard it, or their friend told them, or they were walking home from your father's mustache, which was three blocks up, or Julius's from the sip-in, and they heard it. So also being at Stonewall is kind of like, well, being at the melee in the street. And both of them, you know, I think Stonewall is also an interesting flashpoint in that after it happened, many, many more people started coming out of the woodworks either claiming that they were there, claiming they had been in the movement, you know, really wanting to claim their space and claim that they were sort of leaders and put themselves out in front of, of what this was going to be. Also, even harder to pin down than whether they were there, <laughs> there were also, there are, there's lots of anecdotal, anecdotal evidence that there were a lot of what were called street kids who were essentially young, underage, many of them people, many of them of color, who had been kicked out of their houses, who were living more or less on the street, somewhat on the piers, uh, down Christopher Street by the water, and who were also many of them sex workers, who were hanging out nearby and spilled into the thing on the street, and they, of course, know there is no oral history project of them. There is no, almost no way to even find out how to get to them or if any of them are alive. So that story gets very under-historicized because there's nothing to historicize. There's only the, the I've given to you what there is. That's it, that's what we can talk about. So to, to talk about, again, what I started talking about at the beginning, the drama and scale that history requires, and how do we historicize a group of people who are invisible in the story of New York City in terms of their moment inside a movement where they could not be movers and shakers because they were surviving. So we don't have any art, we have nothing. We have no artifacts, we have no stories, we have no witnesses. But we do have this one video clip um, of Sylvia Rivera talking at um, a Christopher Street gathering, one of the very first prides in New York City um, in 1971. And actually, it, you know, ec again, echoes of the past into the present. Um, this video clip was originally uncovered by the New York City-based artist Tourmaline, and then she found it at the New York Public Library archives, and then it's been, like, you know, taken from her and used by other people without recognition and all these things, which is to... I I'm sharing that to set up this clip because you're going to see... Sylvia, you know, pushed out, essentially, of being able to speak. They don't want to give her the mic at this rally. And this is not, this is 1971 One. rally. So I, we, it's documentable that the movement eventually becomes very white and very male, and that that's who becomes the voice and face of the movement. But I did not think it was this early. And you will see this rally wishing to get her out of the way and what she has to say about it. And with a lot of foul language, just warning you. Hit it, Mike. Thank 
The first time I saw that, I definitely cried. I think not only because of the, it's so powerful, but because we, there's, you know, there are not so many videos of her um, in existence, and I think especially from that time. Um, so, <sighs> tourmaline. Oh, well, here. All right. A couple other people we're going to mention briefly, uh, Stormy Delavery, who um, is also reportedly possibly a thrower of the first brick, quote unquote, um, and Miss Major, um, yeah, we love her, um, who of the last three people that we just talked about is the only one that is still alive and living with us today, like, you know, which is incredible, living icon history. Um, she has done a lot, a lot, a lot of work for trans people and folks who are incarcerated, LGBTQ people. Um, and she came to Brattleboro, uh, Vermont in 2018. And there's a great documentary about her. So Tourmaline came out with this quote, who we just mentioned, um, which kind of, Ain and I were like, this is perfect. It sums up exactly what we are saying um, or wanted to say about this, right? Like, essentially, it, it doesn't matter. Um, 
you know, first brick is what people say constantly. It doesn't matter if it was a brick or a rock or a purse. And if it wasn't any of those things, um, you know, it was a look. It was all of these moments that have been leading up to this one moment that we think of where everything sort of crystallized, even though we know it was everything before and it continues to be everything after. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.